Chapter One of the Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. The Pleasures of Ignorance. It is impossible to take a walk in the country with an average townsman, especially perhaps in April or May without being amazed at the vast continent of his ignorance it is impossible to take a walk in the country oneself without being amazed at the vast continent of one's own ignorance thousands of men and women live and die without knowing the difference between a beech and an elm between the song of a thrush and the song of a blackbird probably in a modern city the man who can distinguish between a thrush's and a blackbird's song is the exception it is not that we have not seen the birds it is simply that we have not noticed them we have been surrounded by birds all our lives yet so feeble is our observation that many of us could not tell whether or not the chaffinch sings or the color of the cuckoo we argue like small boys as to whether the cuckoo always sings as he flies or sometimes in the branches of a tree whether chapman drew on his fancy or his knowledge of nature in the lines when in the oak's green arms the cuckoo sings and first delights men in the lovely springs this ignorance however is not altogether miserable out of it we get the constant pleasure of discovery every fact of nature comes to us each spring if only we are sufficiently ignorant with the dew still on it if we have lived half a lifetime without having ever seen a cuckoo and know it only as a wandering voice we are all the more delighted at the spectacle of its runaway flight as it hurries from wood to wood conscious of its crimes and at the way in which it halts hawk-like in the wind its long tail quivering before it dares descend on a hillside of fir trees where avenging presences may lurk it would be absurd to pretend that the naturalist does not also find pleasure in observing the life of the birds but his is a steady pleasure almost a sober and plodding occupation compared to the morning enthusiasm of the man who sees a cuckoo for the first time and behold the world is made new and as to that the happiness even of the naturalist depends in some measure upon his ignorance which still leaves him new worlds of this kind to conquer he may have reached the very z of knowledge in the books but he still feels half ignorant until he has confirmed each bright particular with his eyes he wishes with his own eyes to see the female cuckoo rare spectacle as she lays her eggs on the ground and takes it in her bill to the nest in which it is destined to breed infanticide he would sit day after day with a field-glass against his eyes in order personally to endorse or refute the evidence suggesting that the cuckoo does lay on the ground and not in a nest and if he is so far fortunate as to discover this most secretive of birds in the very act of laying there still remain for him other fields to conquer in a multitude of such disputed questions as to whether the cuckoo's egg is always of the same color as the other eggs in the nest in which she abandons it assuredly the men of science have no reason as yet to weep over their lost ignorance if they seem to know everything it is only because you and i know almost nothing there will always be a fortune of ignorance waiting for them under every fact they turn up they will never know what songs the sirens sang to ulysses any more than sir thomas brown did if i have called in the cuckoo to illustrate the ordinary man's ignorance it is not because i can speak with authority on that bird it is simply because passing the spring in a parish that seemed to have been invaded by all the cuckoos of africa i realized how exceedingly little i or anybody else i met knew about them but your and my ignorance is not confined to cuckoos it dabbles in all created things from the sun and moon down to the names of the flowers i once heard a clever lady asking whether the new moon always appears on the same day of the week she added that perhaps it is better not to know because if one does not know when or in what part of the sky to expect it 
its appearance is always a pleasant surprise i fancy however that the new moon always comes as a surprise even to those who are familiar with her timetables and it is the same with the coming in of spring and the waves of the flowers we are not the less delighted to find an early primrose because we are sufficiently learned in the services of the year to look for it in march or april rather than in october we know again that the blossom precedes and not succeeds the fruit of the apple tree but this does not lessen our amazement at the beautiful holiday of a may orchard at the same time there is perhaps a special pleasure in relearning the names of many of the flowers every spring it is like rereading a book that one has almost forgotten montaigne tells us that he had so bad a memory that he could always read an old book as though he had never read it before i have myself a capricious and leaking memory i can read hamlet itself and the pickwick papers as though they were the work of new authors and had come wet from the press so much of them fades between one reading and another there are occasions on which a memory of this kind is an affliction especially if one has a passion for accuracy but this is only when life has an object beyond entertainment in respect of mere luxury it may be doubted whether there is not as much to be said for a bad memory as for a good one with a bad memory one can go on reading plutarch and the arabian nights all one's life little shreds and tags it is probable will stick even in the worst memory just as a succession of sheep cannot leap through a gap in a hedge without leaving a few wisps of wool on the thorns but the sheep themselves escape and the great authors leap in the same way out of an idle memory and leave little enough behind and if we can forget books it is as easy to forget the months and what they showed us when once they are gone just for the moment i tell myself that i know may like the multiplication table and could pass an examination on its flowers their appearance and their order today i can affirm confidently that the buttercup has five petals or is it six i knew for certain last week but next year i shall probably have forgotten my arithmetic and may have to learn once more not to confuse the buttercup with the celadine once more i shall see the world as a garden through the eyes of a stranger my breath taken away with surprise by the painted fields i shall find myself wondering whether it is science or ignorance which affirms that the swift that black exaggeration of the swallow and yet a kinsman of the hummingbird never settles even on a nest but disappears at night into the heights of the air i shall learn with fresh astonishment that it is the male not the female cuckoo that sings i may have to learn again not to call the campion a wild geranium or to rediscover whether the ash comes early or late in the etiquette of the trees a contemporary english novelist was once asked by a foreigner what was the most important crop in england he answered without a moment's hesitation rye ignorance so complete as this seems to me to be touched with magnificence but the ignorance even of illiterate persons is enormous the average man who uses a telephone could not explain how a telephone works he takes for granted the telephone the railway train the linotype the aeroplane as our grandfathers took for granted the miracles of the gospels he neither questions nor understands them it is though each of us investigated and made his own only a tiny circle of facts knowledge outside the day's work is regarded by most men as a gigaw still we are constantly in reaction against our ignorance we rouse ourselves at intervals and speculate we revel in speculations about anything at all about life after death or about such questions as that which is said to have puzzled aristotle why sneezing from noon to midnight was good but from night to noon unlucky one of the greatest joys known to man is to take such a flight into ignorance in search of knowledge the great pleasure of ignorance is after all the pleasure of asking questions the man who has lost this pleasure or exchanged it for the pleasure of dogma which is the pleasure of answering is always beginning to stiffen one envies so inquisitive a man as jowett 
who sat down in the study of physiology in his sixties. Most of us have lost the sense of our ignorance long before that age. We even become vain in our squirrel's hoard of knowledge and regard increasing age itself as a school of omniscience. We forget that Socrates was famed for wisdom, not because he was omniscient, but because he realized at the age of seventy that he still knew nothing. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Pleasures of Ignorance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind The Herring Fleet the last spectacle of which christian men are likely to grow tired is a harbour centuries hence there may be jumping off places for the stars and our children's children's and so forth children may regard a ship as a creeping thing scarcely more adventurous than a worm meanwhile every harbour gives us a sense of being in touch if not with the ends of the universe with the ends of the earth this more than the entrance to a wood or the source of a river or the top of a bald hill is the beginning of infinity even the dirtiest coal boat that lies beached in the harbour a mere hulk of utilities that are taken away by dirty men in dirty carts will in a day or two lift itself from the mud on a full tide and float away like a spirit into the sunset or curtsy to the image of the north star mystery lies over the sea every ship is bound for thule that perhaps is why men are content day after day to stand on the pierhead and to gaze at the water and the ships and sailors running up and down the decks and pulling the ropes of sails we may have no reason for pretending to ourselves that the fishing boats are ships of dreams setting out on infinite voyages but none the less even in a fishing village there is always a congregation of watching men and women on the pier every day the crowd collects to see the harbour awake into life with the bustle of men about to set out among the nations of the fishes by day the boats lie side by side in the harbour stand side by side rather like horses in a stable there are two rows of them making a camp of masts on the shallow water in other parts of the harbour white gigs are bottomed on the sand in companies of two and three as the tide slowly rises the masts which have been lying over on one side in a sleepy stillness begin to stir then to sway until with each new impulse of the sea all the boats are dancing and soon the whole harbour is awake and merry as if every mast were a steeple with a peal of bells it is not long till the fishermen arrive one meets them in every cobbled lane how magnificent is the noise made by a man in sea boots on the stones surely he strikes sparks from the road he thumps the ground as with a hammer the earth rings one has seen those boots in the morning hanging outside the door of his house while he slept they have been oiled and left there to dry they have kept the shape of his limb and the crook of his knee in an uncanny way they look as though he had taken off his legs before going into the house and hung them on the wall but the fisherman is a hero not only in his boots his sea coat is no less magnificent this may be of oilskin yellow or of maroon or of stained white or of blue with a blue jersey showing under it then perhaps a red woolen muffler or a scarf with green spots on a red ground round his throat he has not learned to be timid of colour even out of the mouths of his boots 
you may see the ends of red knitted leggings protruding his yellow or black sou'wester roofing the back of his neck he comes down to harbour as splendid as a figure at a fair and always when he arrives he is smoking a pipe as one watches him one wonders if anybody except a fisherman as he looks out over the harbour knows how to smoke he has made tobacco part of himself like breathing if the tide is already full the fishermen are taken off in small rowing boats most of them standing and the place is busy with a criss-cross of travelling crews till the fishing boats are all manned if the water is not yet deep however most of the men walk to their boats lumbering through the waves and occasionally jumping like a wading girl as a larger wave threatens the top of their boots many of them carry their supper in a basket or a handkerchief the first of the boats begins to move out of its stall it is tugged into the clear water and the fishermen put out long oars and row it laboriously to the mouth of the harbour and the wind it is followed by a motor-boat and another and another there are forty putting up their sails like one the harbour moves one has a sense as of things liberated it is though a flock of birds were being loosed into the air as though pigeon after pigeon were being set free out of a basket for home lug sail after lug sail brown as the underside of a mushroom hurries out among the waves a green little tub of a steamboat follows with insolent smoke the motor-boats hasten out like scenting dogs every sort of craft motor-boat gig lugger and steamboat makes for sea higgledy piggledy in a long line an irregular procession of black and blue and green and white and brown here as in the men's clothes the paint pots have been spilled there is nothing more sociable than a fishing fleet the boats overtake each other like horses in a race they gallop in rivalry but for the most part they keep together and move like a travelling town over the sea as likely as not they will have to come back out of the storm into the shelter of the bay and they will ride there till nightfall when every boat becomes a lamp and every sail a shadow in the darkness they hang like a constellation on the oily water they become a company of dancing stars every now and then a boat moves off on a quest of its own it is though the firmament were shaken one hears the kick 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 of the motor and a star has become a will-o'-the-wisp these lights can no more keep still than a playground of children they always make a pattern on the water but they never make the same pattern sometimes they lengthen themselves against the sandy shore on the far side of the bay into a golden river sometimes they huddle together into a little procession of monks carrying tapers one goes down to the harbour after breakfast the next morning to see what has been the result of the night's fishing one does not really need to go down one can see it afar off there is a movement as at the building of a city on every boat men are busy emptying the nets disentangling the fish that have been caught by the gills tumbling them in a liquid mass into the bottom of the boat one can hardly see the fish separately they flow into one another they are a pool of quicksilver one is amazed as the disciples must have been amazed at the miraculous draught everything is covered with their scales the fishermen are spotted as if with confetti their hands their brown coats their boots are a mass of white and blue spots the laborers with the gurries great blue boxes 
that are carried like sedan chairs between two pairs of handles come up alongside and the fish are ladled into the gurries from tin pans as each gurry is filled the men hasten off with it to where the auctioneer is standing with the help of a small notebook and a lead pencil he auctions it before an outsider can wink and the gurry is taken a few yards further where women are pouring herrings into barrels they too are covered with fish scales from head to foot they are dabbled like a painter's palette so great is the hall that every cart in the countryside has come down to lend a hand the fish are poured into the carts over the side of the boats like water old fishermen stand aside and look on with a sense of having wasted their youth they recall the time when they went fishing in the north sea and had to be content at a shilling and sixpence a cran a cran being equal to four gurries or about a thousand herrings who is there now who would sell even a hundred herrings for one and sixpence who is there who would sell a hundred herrings for ten and sixpence yet one gig alone this morning has brought in fourteen thousand herrings no wonder that there is an atmosphere of excitement in the harbour no wonder that the carts almost run over you as they make journey after journey between boat and barrel no wonder that three different sorts of seagulls the herring gull the lesser black-headed gull and the black-backed gull have gathered about us in screaming multitudes and fill the air like a snowstorm every child in the town seems to be making for home with its finger in a fish's mouth or in two fishes mouths or in three fishes mouths artists have hurried down to the harbour and have set up their easels on every spot that is not already occupied by a fish barrel or an auctioneer or a man with a knife in his teeth preparing to gut a dogfish the town has lost its head it has become midas for the day every time it opens its mouth a herring comes out a doom of herrings has come upon us the smell rises to heaven it is though we were breathing fish scales even the pretty blue overalls of the children have become spotted everywhere barrels and boxes have been piled high we are hoisting them onto carts farm carts grocers carts coal carts any sort of carts we must get rid of the stuff at all costs anything to drive it up the hill to the railway station the very horses are frenzied they stick their toes into the hill and groan the drivers excited with cupidity as they think of all the journeys they will be able to make before evening bully them and beat them with the ends of the reins their eyes are excited their gestures impatient they fill the town with clamour and smell it is an occasion on which as the vulgar say they wouldn't call the queen their aunt this i fancy is where all the romance of the sea began in the story of a greedy man and a fresh herring the ship was a symbol of man's questing stomach long before it was a symbol of his questing soul he was a hungry man not a poet when he built the first harbour luckily the harbour made a poet of him sails gave him wings he learned to traffic for wonders he became a traveller he told tales he discovered the illusion of horizons perhaps however it is less the sailor than the ship that attracts our imagination the ship seems to convey to us more than anything else a sense at once of perfect freedom and perfect adventure that is why we are content to stand on the harbour stones all day and watch anything with sails we ourselves want to live in some such freedom and adventure as this we are feeding our appetite for liberty 
as we gaze hungrily after the ships making their way out of harbor into the sea end of chapter two Chapter 3 of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen M. Lafitte. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. Chapter 3 The Betting Man. If the panther wins the derby, he didn't, as most people apparently expect him to do. His victory will carry more weight among frequenters of racecourses as an argument for socialism than any that has yet been invented. For the panther is a government-bred horse, born and brought up in defiance of the laissez-faire principles of Mr. Harold Cox. He will therefore carry the colors of a great principle at Epsom as well as those of his present lessee. Who would have thought five years ago that the Derby favorite of 1919 would start under so grave a responsibility? Not that racing men have much time to spare for thoughts about social problems, even when these are related to a horse. Theirs is a busy life. They enjoy little of the leisure that falls to the lot of statesmen and haberdashers. Their anxieties are a serial story continued from one edition of the day's paper to another, nor does the last edition of the evening paper make an end to their anxieties. It's not an epilogue to one day so much as a prologue to the next. The program of races for the following day suggests more problems than the peace conference itself could settle in a month. The racing man, having studied the names of the horses entered, goes out to buy some tobacco. As he takes his change from the tobacconist, he asks, Have you heard anything for tomorrow? The tobacconist says, I heard Green Cloak for the first race. The racing man nods. You didn't hear anything for the big race? He asks. No. Somebody was saying Holy Saint. I heard Oily Hair, says the racing man gravely. Good night. And he goes out. His brow becomes knitted with thought as he moves off along the pavement. He tells himself that Holy Saint certainly does offer difficulties. Holy Saint is a notoriously bad starter. If he could be trusted to get away, he would be one of the finest horses of his year in the long-distance racing. But he's continually being left at the post. The backing would be pure gambling. He could win if he liked, but would he like? On the whole... Oily Hair is a safer horse to back. He has already beaten Holy Saint in the Chiswick Cup and only lost the Scotch Plate to disaster by a neck. As the racing man allows his memory to dwell on the achievements of Oily Hair, his confidence rises. I see nothing to beat him, he says to himself. He has just decided to put a fiver on him when he meets an acquaintance who suggests a drink. As they drink, the talk turns on horses. What are you backing in the big race tomorrow? Have you heard anything? I heard Oily Hair. I think not. I'll tell you why. Tommy Fitzgibbon's youngest sister is at school with two sisters of Willie Soames, who's going to ride Peace on Earth tomorrow, and one of them told her that Willie had written to her to put every half penny she has on Peace on Earth. I'm sick and sore and tired of backing Peace on Earth. He's a cantankerous beast that seems to take a positive pleasure in losing races. Well, remember what I told you. On arriving home, our sportsman goes to his shelves and takes down the latest annual volume of McCall's Racing Chronicle and Pocket Turf Calendar and looks up Peace on Earth in the index. He turns up the record of one race after another and finds that the horse has a better pass than he had remembered. He cannot make up his mind what to do. He looks over several weekly papers to see if any of them can throw light on his difficulties. Each of them names a different winner for the big race. When he puts on his pajamas that night, all he knows is that he has decided to decide nothing till the next day. Next day, he once more reads the names of the horses entered for the various races, 
and glances down the list of winners selected by the racing prophet in the morning paper. Having breakfast late, he finds he has only about an hour to waste before catching a train for the races, and he resolves to pay a call at the Bird of Paradise, where a friend of his, who has an unusual gift for picking up information, is usually to be found about noon. He learns from the landlord that his friend has been in and gone away, but the landlord tells him that he hears pudding is a certainty. Have you any reason for thinking so? Well, there was a man in here who has a son, a policeman, close by Jobson Stables, and he tells me that everybody in the neighborhood has been backing pudding down for the last spoon. That looks as if the word has been passed around that it was going to win. The racing man passes out and looks in at the pink elephant to see if his friend is there. He is seated at a little table in an upstairs parlor with four others, all drinking whiskey and exchanging tips. They belong to the most credulous race of men alive. They are all believers in what is called information, and information is simply the betting man's name for gossip. The friend is speaking in a low but excited voice to his companions, who crouch over towards him in order to catch information not meant for the rest of the room. He tells how he had just been in to buy a paper at his newsagent's, and how his newsagent had been calling on his solicitor that morning, and the solicitor told him that the caller who had just left as he came in was Gordon, the owner of Cut and Run, and Gordon said that Cut and Run was the biggest thing that had ever come into his hands. The buzz-buzz of talk and the smoke-filled room and the clatter of passing carts makes it difficult to hear him. But the others lean over the table with red and tint faces, like men among whom an apostle has come. They do not stay long over their drinks, as they have not much time for social pleasures. They swallow their whiskey with a quick gesture, look at their watches, stand up hurriedly, and part with handshakes. Then comes the drive to the railway station, where race cards are being sold. The racing man buys a card and several papers. He looks down the list of the horses again in the train and tries to make up his mind whether to take the tobacconist's tip and bat green cloak for the first race. He believes greatly in breeding, and by far the best-bred horse in the race is Liberal, who has three derby winners in his pedigree. Then there is Red Rose, who created a sensation a month ago by winning two races in a day. He decides to do nothing till he sees the horses themselves. He pays thirty shillings at the turnstile of the race course and is admitted to the grandstand. Already, one or two bookmakers are shouting from the stands, and some of them have chalked up on the blackboards the odds they are willing to give in the big race. He looks at the board and sees that he can get twenties against cut and run. A five-pound note might bring him a hundred pounds. On the other hand, if Ole Hare was going to win, he wouldn't like to miss it. The bookmakers are offering fives against him. Holy Sane is hot favored at two to one. That alone makes him impatient of it, for he dislikes backing favorites. He prefers the big wrist, with great scoops if he wins. However, he will make up his mind later. Meanwhile, he will go to the paddock and have a look at the horses for the first race. Half a dozen horses are already out, and men with numbers on their arms are walking them around and around in a ring. He consults his card and sees that number seven is Brighton Beauty, and number two, a slender gloss black beast with a white star in his forehead, green cloak. Liberal has not appeared. The numbers for the starters with the names of the jockeys are now being hoisted. He makes a pencil mark opposite the name of each starter on his racing card, and jots down the name of the jockey. Wrath, he sees, is riding green cloak. That is in his favor. When he gets back to the betting ring, the bookmakers are shouting hoarsely against each other. Liberal is a very hot favorite. They are shouting, I'll take two to one, I'll take two to one, five to one, bar one, a hundred to eight, green cloak. He feels almost sure Liberal will win, but green cloak, he wishes he had asked the tobacconist where he got his information from. Anyhow, half a sovereign doesn't matter much. He goes up to a bookmaker and says, Ten shillings, green cloak. The bookmaker turns to his clerk and says, Six pound, five to ten shillings, green cloak. Gives a red, white, and blue card with his name and a number on it. The other takes the card, writes on the back of it the name of the horse and the amount of the bet, and makes for the stand to see the race. 
the horses have now come out and are off one after another to the starting post. Green Cloak would be hard to miss because of his jockey's colors, old gold, scarlet sleeves, and green and black quartered cap. The bell has hardly rung to announce that the race has begun when men in the crowd begin to dogmatize about the result. One man keeps saying, Green Cloak wins this race, Green Cloak wins this race. Another says, Liberal leads, another says, No, that's Jumping Frog. To the unaccustomed eye, the horses seem as close to each other as a swarm of bees. Suddenly, however, a bay horse springs forward and seems to put a length between itself and the others at every stride. The people in the stand shout, Liberal! Liberal! It wins by about ten lengths. Green Cloak is second, but a bad second. The crowd begins to pour down the stands again. Those who have won wait near the bookmakers till the winner has been to the unsaddling enclosure and the announcement, all right, is made. Then the bookmakers begin the payout, and the crowd moves off to the paddock again to see the horses for the next race. Friends stop each other and exchange information in low voices. Others do their best to listen in the hope of overhearing information. I hear Tomps. Johnny says lay your last penny on Glasgow Ped. I'm going to back submarine. And the parade of horses, the hoisting of the names of their starters and jockeys, the laying of the bets, and the climbing of the grandstand are all gone through over and over again. The betting man has no time even for a drink. To the casual onlooker, a day's horse racing has the appearance of a day's holiday. But the racing man knows better. He is collecting information, coming to decisions, wandering among the bookies in hope of getting a good price, climbing into the grandstand and descending from it, studying the points of the horses all the time with as little chance of leisure as though he were a stockbroker during a financial crisis or a sailor on a sinking ship. Perhaps in the train on the way home from the races he may relax a little. Certainly if he has bat cut and run he will, for cut and run one at ten to one and his pocket is full of five-pound notes. He feels quite jocular now that the strain is over. He makes puns on the names of the defeated horses. Lie low, lay low, all right, he announces to the compartment, indifferent to the scrowls of the man in the corner who had backed it. Hopscotch didn't hop quite fast enough. Were he tipsy, he cannot jest more fluently. His jokes are small, but be not too severe on him. The man has had a hard day. Wait but an hour, and care will descend on him again. He will not have sat down to dinner in his hotel for three minutes until someone will be saying to him, Have you heard anything for the cup tomorrow? There is no six hours day for the betting man. He is the drudge of chance for every waking hour. He is enviable only for one thing. He knows what to talk about to barbers. End of chapter 3 Recording by Stephen M. Lafitte Chapter 4 of The Pleasures of Ignorance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Julian Haver The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind the hum of insects. It makes all the difference whether you hear an insect in the bedroom or in the garden. In the garden the voice of the insect soothes, in the bedroom it irritates. In the garden it's the hum of spring, in the bedroom it seems to belong to the same school of music as the bees of the dentist's drill or the sawmill. It may be that it is not the right sort of insect that invades the bedroom. Even in the garden we wave away a mosquito. Either its note is in itself offensive or we dislike it as the voice of an unscrupulous enemy. By an unscrupulous enemy I mean an enemy that attacks without waiting to be attacked. The mosquito is a beast of prey. It's out for blood, whether one is as gentle as Tom Pinch or uses violence. The bee and the wasp are in comparison noble creatures. They will, so it is said, never injure a human being unless a human being has injured them. The worst of it is they do not discriminate between one human being and another. 
and the bee that floats over the wall into our garden may turn out to have been exasperated by the behaviour of a retired policeman five miles away who struck at it with a spade and roused in it a blind passion for reprisals that or something like it is probably the explanation of the stings perfectly innocent persons receive from an insect that is said never to touch you if you leave it alone as a matter of fact when a bee loses its head it doesn't even wait for a human being in order to relieve its feelings i have seen a dog racing round a field and terror as a result of a stink from an angry bee i have seen a turkey racing round a farmyard in terror as a result of the same thing all the trouble arose from a human being's having very properly removed a large quantity of honey from a row of hives. I do not admit that the bee would have been justified in stinging even the human being who, after all, is master on this partially civilized planet. It had certainly no right to sting the dog or the turkey, which had as little to do with stealing the honey as the vice-chancellor of Oxford University. Yet in spite of such things, and of the fact that some breeds of bees are notorious for their crossness, especially when there is thunder in the air, the bee is morally far higher in the scale than the mosquito. Not only does it give you honey instead of malaria, and help your apples and strawberries to multiply, but it aims at living a quiet, inoffensive life, at peace with everybody, except when it is annoyed. The mosquito does what it does in cold blood. That is why it is so unwelcome a bedroom visitor. But even a bee or a wasp, I fancy, would seem tedious company at two in the morning, especially if it came and buzzed near the pillow. It is not so much that you would be frightened. If the wasp alighted on your cheek, you could always lie still and hold your breath till it had finished trying to sting. That is an infallible preventive. But there is a limit to the amount of your night's rest that you are willing to sacrifice in this way. You cannot hold your breath while you are asleep and you dare not cease holding your breath while a wasp is walking over your face. Besides, it might crawl into your ear, and what would you do then? Luckily, the question doesn't often arise in practice owing to the fact that the wasp and the bee are more like human beings than mosquitoes and have more or less the same habits of nocturnal rest. As we sit in the garden, however, the mind is bound to speculate, and to revolve such questions as whether this hum of insects that delights us is in itself delightful, whether its delightfulness depends on its surroundings, or whether it depends on its associations with past springs. Certainly, in a garden, the noise of insects seems as essentially beautiful a thing as the noise of birds or the noise of the sea. Even these have been criticized, especially by persons who suffer from sleeplessness, but their beauty is affirmed by the general voice of mankind. These three noises appear to have an infinite capacity for giving us pleasure, a capacity probably beyond that of any music of instruments. It may be that on hearing them we become a part of some universal music, and that the rhythm of wave, bird and insect echoes in some way the rhythm of our own breath and blood. Man is in love with life, and these are the millionfold chorus of life, the magnified echo of his own pleasure in being alive. At the same time, our pleasure in the hum of insects is also, I think, a pleasure of reminiscence. It reminds us of other springs and summers in other gardens. It reminds us of the infinite peace of childhood when on a fine day the world hardly existed beyond the garden gate. We can smell moss roses, how we loved them as children, as a bee swings by. Insect after insect dances through the air, each dying away like a note of music. And we see again the border of pinks and the strawberries and the garden paths edged with box and the old dilapidated wooden seat under the tree and an apple tree in the long grass, and a stream beyond the apple tree, and all of those things that made us infinitely happy as children when we were in the country. Happier than we were ever made by toys, for we do not remember any toys so intensely as we remember the garden and the farm. We had the illusion in those days that it was going to last forever. There was no past or future, there was nothing real except the present in which we lived, a present in which all the human beings were kind, in which a dim-sighted grandfather sang songs, especially a song in which the chorus began free and easy, in which Hans brought us animal biscuits out of town, in which there was neither man-servant nor maid-servant, neither ox nor ass, that didn't seem to go about with a bright face. It was a present that overflowed with kindness, though everybody except the ox and the ass believed that it was only by the skin of our teeth that any of us would escape being burnt alive for eternity. Perhaps we thought little enough about it except on Sundays or at prayers. 
Certainly no one was gloomy about it before children. William John McNabb, the huge labourer who looked after the horses, greeted us all as cheerfully as if we had been saved and ready for paradise. It would be unfair to human beings, however, to suggest that they are less lavish with their smiles than they were thirty years or so ago. Everybody, or almost everybody, still smiles. We can hardly stop to talk to a man in the street without a duet of smiles. The Prince of Wales smiles across the world from left to right, and the Crown Prince of Japan smiles across the world from right to left. We cannot open an illustrated paper without seeing smiling statesmen, cricketers, jockeys, oarsmen, bridegrooms, clergymen, actresses, and undergraduates. Yet somehow we are no longer made happy by a smile. We no longer take it, as we used to take it, as evidence that the person smiling is either happy or kind. It then seemed to come from the heart. It now seems a formula. It is, we may admit, a pleasant and useful formula, but a man might easily be a burglar or a murderer or a cabinet minister and smile. Some people are supposed to smile merely in order to show what good teeth they have. William John McNabb, I am sure, never did that. We needn't grumble at our contemporaries, however, for not being so fine as William John McNabb. To children, for all we know, the world may still seem to be full of people who laugh because they are happy and smile because they are kind. The world will always retain to a child the chief of toys and the harm of insects as enchanting as the harm of a musical top. Even those of us who are grown up can recover this enchantment, not only through the pleasures of memory, but through the endless pleasures of watching the things that inhabit the earth. The world is always waiting to be discovered in full, and yet no life is long enough to discover the whole of a single county, or even the whole of a single parish. Who alive, for instance, knows all the moles of Sussex? I confess I got my first sight of one a few days ago, and though I had seen dead moles hanging from trees and had read descriptions of moles, the living creature was as unexpected as if one had come on it silent upon a peak in Darien. I had never expected it to look so black and glossy in the midday sun, or to have that little pink snout that made me think of it as a small underground pig. I had always been told, too, that the sound of a footstep would frighten a mole, but this mole only began to show fright at the sound of voices. Then it began to tear its way into the undergrowth with paws and snout ever trying to overtake each other. Mr. Blunton has described how the lost mole tries to pierce the mattocked clay in agony and terror of the sun. I got much the same impression of agony and terror as this poor creature dug its way into the grass and ferns, and coming out at the far end of the clump, bolted under a tree like a frightened pig. And yet, they say, this poor little coward is a fierce animal enough. He is, we are told, impelled by so cruel a hunger that he would die of it were it to go unsatisfied for even twenty-four hours. If he can find nothing else to eat, he will kill and eat a fellow mole. So the authorities tell us, but I wonder how many of the authorities have ever seen a mole in the very act of cannibalism. How many of them have followed him on his long journeys through the bowels of the earth? He certainly looked no South Sea monster on the Sunday morning on which for a few seconds I watched him. Nor would John Clare have written affectionately about him had he been entirely bloody-minded. Then there was the hedgehog. The charm of hedgehogs is that we do not see them every day, that their appearance is a secret and an accident. They are a part of the busy life that goes on all about us as mysteriously as the movements of spirits. Consequently, when I was looking over a sloping field the other evening, and, hearing a crackling as of sticks being trodden on, turned my eyes and saw a living creature making its way out of a wood into the grass, I was delighted to find that it was a hedgehog, and not a man or a rat. I could see it only dimly in the twilight, and it was difficult to believe that so small an animal had made so great a noise. The pleasure of recognition, unfortunately, was not mutual. No sooner did the hedgehog hear a foot pressing on the road than it gave up all thoughts of its supper of insects and hobbled back into the thicket. I regretted only that I hadn't made a greater noise and scared it into rolling itself into a ball as everybody says it does when alarmed. But it is perhaps just as well that the hedgehog didn't merely repeat itself in this way. We like a certain variety of behaviour in animals, some element of the unexpected that always keeps our curiosity alive and looking forward but we must not exaggerate the pleasure to be got from moles and hedgehogs. They make a part of our being happy, but they do not delight the whole of our being, as a child is delighted by the world every spring. 
it is probably the child in us that responds most wholeheartedly to such pleasures. They, like the harm of insects, help to restore the illusion of a world that is perfectly happy, because it is such a Noah's Ark of a spectacle, and everybody is kind. But even as we submit to the illusion in the garden, we become restive in our deck chairs, and remember the telephone or the daily paper or a letter that has to be written, and reality weighs on us, like a hand laid on a top, making an end of the spinning, making an end of the music. The world is no longer a toy dancing round and round. It is a problem, a run-down machine, a stuffy room full of little stabbing creatures that make an irritating noise. End of section 4《Chapter Five of the Pleasures of Ignorance》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec.《The Pleasures of Ignorance》by Robert Lind, Chapter Five, Cats. The Champion Cat Show has been held at the Crystal Palace but the champion cat was not there. One could not possibly allow him to appear in public. He is for show, but not in a cage. He does not compete, because he is above competition. You know this as well as I. Probably you possess him. I certainly do. That is the supreme test of a cat's excellence, the test of possession. One does not say, you should see Brailsford's cat or you should see Adcock's cat, or you should see Sharp's cat, but you should see our cat. There is nothing we are more egoistic about, not even children, than about cats. I have heard a man, for lack of anything better to boast about, boasting that his cat eats cheese. In anyone else's cat it would have seemed an inferior habit, and only worth mentioning to the servant as a warning. But because the cat happens to be his cat, this man talks about its vice excitedly among women, as though it were an accomplishment. It is seldom that we hear a cat publicly reproached with guilt by anyone above a cook. He is not permitted to steal from our own larder, but if he visits the next-door house by stealth and returns over the wall with a dover's soul in his jaws, we really cannot help laughing. We are a little nervous at first, and our mirth is tinged with pity at the thought of the probably elderly and dyspeptic gentleman who has had his luncheon filched away almost from under his nose. If we were quite sure that it was from number 14, and not from number 9 or number 11, that the fish had been stolen, we might, conceivably, call round and offer to pay for it. But with a cat, one is never quite sure." and we cannot call round on all the neighbors and make a general announcement that our cat is a thief. In any case, the next move lies with the wronged neighbor. As day follows day, there is no sign of his irate and murder-bent figure advancing up the path. We recover our mental balance and begin to see the cat's exploit in a new light. We do not yet extol it on moral grounds, but Undoubtedly, the more we think of it, the deeper becomes our admiration. Of the two great heroes of the Greeks, we admire one for his valor and one for his cunning. The epic of the cat is the epic of Odysseus. The old gentleman with the Dover soul gradually assumes the aspect of a Polyphemus, outwitted. Outwitted and humiliated to the point of not even being able to throw things after his tormentor. Clever cat. Nobody else's cat could have done such a thing. We should like to celebrate the rape of the Dover soul in Latin verse. As for the Achillean sort of prowess, we do not demand it of a cat, but we are proud of it when it exists. There is a pleasure in seeing strange cats fly at his approach, either in single file over the wall or in the scattered aimlessness of a bursting bomb. Theoretically, we hate him to fight, but if he does fight and comes home with a torn ear, we have to summon up all the resources of our finer nature in order not to rejoice on noticing that the cat next door looks as though it had been through a railway accident. I am sorry for the cat next door. I hate him so, and it must be horrible to be hated, 
but he should not sit on my wall and look at me with yellow eyes if his eyes were any other color even the blue that is now said to be the mark of the runaway husband i feel certain i could just manage to endure him but they are the sort of yellow eyes that you expect to see looking out at you from a hole in the panelling in a novel by mr sax romer the only reason why i am not frightened of them is that the cat is so obviously frightened of me i never did him any injury unless to hate is to injure but he lowers his head when i appear as though he expected to be a guillotined he does not run away he merely crouches like a guilty thing perhaps he remembers how often he has stepped delicately over my seed beds but not so delicately as to leave no mark of ruin among the infant lettuces and the less than infant autumn sprouting broccoli these things i could forgive him but it is not easy to forgive him the look in his eyes when he watches a bird at its song they are ablaze with evil he becomes a sort of jack the ripper at the opera people tell us that we should not blame cats for this sort of thing that it is their nature and so forth they even suggest that a cat is no more cruel in eating robin than we are cruel ourselves in eating chicken this seems to me to be quibbling in the first place there is an immense difference between a robin and a chicken in the second place we are willing to share our chicken with the cat at least we are willing to share the skin and such of the bones as are not required for soup besides the cat has not the same need of delicacies as a human being it can eat and even digest anything it can eat the black skin of filleted place it can eat the bits of gristle that people leave on the side of their plates it can eat boiled cod it can eat new zealand mutton there is no reason why an animal with so undiscriminating a palate should demand songbirds for its food when even human beings who are fairly unscrupulous eaters have agreed in some measure to abstain from them on reflection however i doubt if it is his appetite for birds that makes the cat with the yellow eyes feel guilty if you were able to talk to him in his own language and formulate your accusations against him as a bird eater he would probably be merely puzzled and look on you as a crank if you pursued the argument and compelled him to moralize his position he would i fancy explain that birds were very wicked creatures and that their cruelties to the worms and the insects were more than flesh and blood could stand he would work himself up into a generous idealization of himself as the guardian of law and order amid the bloody strife of the cabbage patch the preserver of the balance of nature if cats were as clever as we they would compile an atrocities blue book about worms alas poor thrush with how bedraggled a reputation would you come through such an exposure with how hunnish a tread would you be depicted treading the lawn sparing neither age nor sex seizing the infant worm as it puts out its head to take its first bewildered peep at the rolling sun cats would write sonnets on such a theme then there is that other beautiful potential poem the cry of the snail how tender-hearted cats are their sympathy seems to be all but universal always on the lookout for an object ready to extend itself anywhere where it is needed except as is but human to their victims yellow eyes or not i begin to be persuaded that the cat next door is a noble fellow it may well be that his look as i pass is a look not of fear but of repulsion he has seen me going out among the worms with a sharp no not a very sharp spade and regards me as no better than an ogre if i could only explain to him but i shall never be able to do so he could no more appreciate my point of view about worms than i can appreciate his about robins luckily we both eat chicken this may ultimately help us to understand one another on the other hand part of the fascination of cats may be due to the fact that it is so difficult to come to an understanding with them a man talks to a horse or a dog as to an equal to a cat he has to be deferential as though it had some sphinx-like quality that baffled him he cannot order a cat about with the certainty of being obeyed 
he cannot be sure that if he speaks to it it will even raise its eyes if it is perfectly comfortable it will not a cat is obedient only when it is hungry or when it takes the fancy it may be a parasite but it is never a servant the dog does your bidding but you do the cats at the same time the contrast between the cat and the dog has often been exaggerated by dog lovers they tell you stories of dogs that remained with their dead masters as though there were no fidelity in cats it was only the other day however that the newspaper gave an account of a cat that remained with the body of its murdered mistress in the most faithful tradition of the dogs i know again of cats that will go out for a walk with a human fellow creature as dogs do i have frequently seen a lady walking across hampstead heath with a cat in train when you go for a walk with a dog however the dog protects you when you go for a walk with a cat you feel that you are protecting the cat it is strange that the cat should have imposed the myth of its helplessness on us it is an animal with an almost boundless capacity for self-help it can jump up walls it can climb trees it can run as the proverb says like greased lightning it is armed like an african chief yet it has contrived to make itself a pampered pet so that we are alarmed if it attempts to follow us out of the gate into a world of dogs and only feel happy when it is purring rolling on its back and purring as we rub its adam's apple by the fireside there is nothing that gives a greater sense of comfort than the purring of a cat it is the most flattering music in nature one feels as one listens like a humble lover in a bad novel who says you do then like me a little after all the fact that a cat is not utterly miserable in our presence always comes with the freshness and delight of a surprise the happiness of a crowing baby newly introduced to us may be still more flattering but a cat will get round people who cannot tolerate babies it is all the more to be wondered at that a cat which is such a master of this conversational sort of music should ever attempt any other there never was an animal less fit to be a singer someone was it cowper has said that there are no really ugly voices in nature and that he could imagine that there was something to be said even for the donkey's bray i should have thought that the beautiful voices in nature were few and that most of them could be defended only on the ground of some pleasant association humanity at least has been unanimous in its condemnation of the cat as part of nature's chorus poems have been written in praise of the corncrake as a singer but never of the cat all the associations we have with cats have not accustomed us to that discordant howl it converts love itself into a torment such as can be found only in the pages of a twentieth-century novel in it we hear the jungle decadent the beast in dissolution but not yet civilized when it rises at night outside the window we always explain to visitors no that's not peter that's the cat next door with the yellow eyes the man who will not defend the honor of his cat cannot be trusted to defend anything End of chapter 5. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. Chapter 6 of The Pleasures of Ignorance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind. 6. May May is chiefly remarkable for being the only month in which one does not like cats. June, too, perhaps, but after that one does not mind if the garden is full of cats. One likes to have a wild beast whose movements, lazy as those of Satan, will terrify the childish birds out of the gooseberry bushes and the raspberries and strawberries. He will not, we know, have much chance of catching them as late as that. They will be as cunning as he, and the robin will wind his alarm clock, the starling in the plum tree will cry out like a hysterical drake, and the blackbird will make as much noise as a farmyard. 
the cat can but blink at the clamor of such a host of cunning sentinels and pretending that he had come out only to take the air return majestically to his dinner of leavings in the kitchen in may and june however one does not wish the birds to be frightened one would like one's garden to be in alsatia for all their wings and all their songs there is no hope of this in a garden full of cats even a tetrazzini would cease to be able to produce her best trills if every time she opened her mouth a tiger padded in her direction down a path of currant bushes there are it may be admitted heroic exceptions the chaffinch sits in the plum and blusters out his music cat or no cat to be sure he only sings a flush of all the colors in order to distract our attention he is not an artist but a watchman if you look into the bedelia tree beside him you will see his hen moving about in silence creeping dancing fluttering as she gorges herself with insects she is a flycatcher at this season leaping into the air and pirouetting as she seizes her prey and returns to the bough she is restless and is not content with the spoil of a single tree she flings herself gracefully like a ballet dancer into the plum and takes up a caterpillar in her beak she does not eat it at once but stands still eyeing you as though awaiting your applause her husband sitting on the topmost spray goes on singing his version of the roast beef of old england she does not even now eat the caterpillar but hurries along the paths of the branches with the obvious purpose of finding a tasty insect to eat along with it it may be that there are insects that play the part of mustard or worcestershire sauce in the chaffinch world what a meal she is making in any case before she hurries back to her nest it seems that among the chaffinches the male is the more spiritual of the sexes but then he has so little to do compared with the female he is still in that state of savagery in which the male dresses finely in idols the thrush cannot carry on with the same indifference to cats he is the most nervous of parents and spends half his time calling on his children to be careful the young thrush hopping about on the lawn knows nothing of cats and refuses to believe that they are dangerous he is not afraid even of human beings his parent becomes argumentative to the point of tears but the young one stays where he is and looks at you with a sideways jerk of his head as much to say listen to the old un you too begin to be alarmed at such boldness you know like the pitiful parent that the world is a very dangerous place and that your neighbor's cat goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour it has been contended by some men of science that all birds are born fearless after the manner of the young thrush and that fear is a lesson that has to be taught to each new generation by the more experienced parents fear they say is not an inherited instinct but a racial tradition that has to be communicated like the morality of civilized people the young thrush on the lawn is certainly a witness on behalf of this theory he hops toward you instead of away from you he moves his gaping beak as though he were trying to say something if there were no cats in the world you would encourage his confidences but you feel that much as you would like to make friends with him you must for his own sake give him his first lesson in fear you try to give yourself the appearance of a grim giant it has no effect on him you make a quick movement to chase him away he runs a few yards and then stops and looks round at you as though you were playing a game it is too much to expect of you that you will actually throw stones at a bird for its good and so you give up his education as a bad job alas in two days your worst fears are justified his dead body is found torn and ruffled among the bushes some cat has murdered him murdered him evidently not in hunger but just for fun two indignant children one gold one brown discover the dead body and bring in the tail they prepare the funeral rites of one whose only sin was his innocence this is not the first burial in the garden there is already a cemetery marked with half a dozen crosses and heaped with flowers under the pear tree on the south wall here is where the mouse was buried here were the starling and here the rabbit's skull 
They all lie there under the earth in boxes, as you and I will lie, expecting the last trump. The robins are not kinder to the friendless bodies of unburied men than our children to the bodies of mice and birds. Here the ghost of no creature haunts, reproaching us with the absence of the tomb, as the dead sailor washed up on an alien shore reproaches us so often in the pages of the Greek anthology. There is a procession to the grave, and all due ceremony. There is even a funeral service. Over the starling, perhaps, it lacks something in appropriateness. The barriers meant well, however. Their favorite in verse at the time was Lars Persina Ecclusium, and they gave the starling the best they knew. Gave it to him from beginning to end. What he made of it, there is no telling. He is, it is said, an impressionable bird, though something of a satirist. Someone overhearing them recommended a briefer and more fitting service for the future. The young thrush had the benefit of the advice. He was laid to his last rest with the recitation of that noblest of valedictories, Fear no more the heat of the sun, over his tomb. He is now gone where there is no cat or parent to disturb. The priests who buried him declare that he has been turned into a golden nightingale, and that there must be no noise or romping in the garden for three days, as not till then will he have arrived safely at the Apleiades. That is the name they give to the Pleiades, the seven golden islands, whither pass the souls of dead mice and birds and dolls and, and where Scarlatti lives, and where you too may expect to go, if you please them. Even the black cat will probably go there, one's own black cat, but not the neighbor's cat, the reddish-brown one, thief, murderer, and beast. It is the neighbor's cat that makes one believe there is a hell. Short is the memory of man, however, shorter the memory of children. There is no gloom that can withstand May pouring itself out in the deep blue of Anchusa and the paler blue of Lupin, gushing out in the yellow of Laburnum, tossing like the tides in the wind. One is gloomy, perhaps, when one looks at the lettuces and sees how slow is their growth. Watching a plant grow is like watching a kettle boil. It seems to take eons. The patience of gardeners always astonishes me. Regarding my profession, I should spend half my time inventing schemes for making plants grow up in a night, like Jonah's gourd. I should not mind about parsnips. A parsnip might mature as slowly as an oak and live as long for all I care. There is something, it may be, to be said for parsnips, as there is something, it may be, to be said for Mr. Bonar Law. But I do not know it. They do not even tempt the slugs and the leather jackets away from the lettuces. There is nothing that puzzles one more in a friend than if he confesses to a taste for parsnips. Immediately a gulf yawns deeper than could be caused by any confession of religious or moral eccentricity. One's sympathies instinctively close up like a sea anemone touched by a child's finger. Yet people eat them. All that you and I know about them is that kind words do not butter them. But if you go to Covent Garden at the right time of year, you will undoubtedly find them being sold for food. Why should they make one gloomy, however? seeing that one has successfully excluded them from one's garden. Perhaps one is gloomy because of the reflection that there must be many other gardens in which they are growing. Gloom of this kind, however, is mere philanthropy. Turn your eyes instead to the strawberry flowers and think of June. Consider the broad beans and the young peas safe amid their tall stakes. Consider even the spring onions, is it any wonder that the chaffinch sings and the wren is operatic on the thither side of the garden wall? High in the air the swifts scream as they rush here and there after their prey, like polo teams galloping, pulling up, scrimmaging, turning, and off on the gallop again. The swift is an evil-looking bird, but playful. He has none of the grace of the swallow, for he cannot fold his wings, and he is black as a devil-worshipper. Still, he knows more of sport than most of the birds. I suspect that those rushing companions are not merely bent on food, 
but have chosen out one individual insect for their pursuit like a ball in a game. Otherwise, why such excitement? There are billions of insects to be had for the mere asking. The flycatcher knows this. He can spend an hour at a meal without ever flying more than ten yards from his bow. Still, one rejoices in the energy of the swift. One wishes the green finch had a little of it. The yellow splashes on his wings are undoubtedly delightful. But why will he perch so long in the acacia, wailing like a sick cricket? And why did Wordsworth write a poem in praise of him? Probably he mistook some other bird for him. Poets are like that. Or perhaps he liked the noise like the voice of a sick cricket. One can never tell with Wordsworth. He had a cuckoo clock. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Pleasures of Ignorance This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lynn Seven New Year Prophecies Some people are surprised at the daring with which compilers of prophetic almanacs forecast the details of the future. The most astonishing thing of all is that nearly everybody still regards the future as a mystery. As a matter of fact, we know a great deal about the future. We know that next year will contain 365 days. We know, and this is rather a tribute to our cleverness, that the year 1924 will contain 366 days, and even the exact point at which the extra day will slip in. Ask a savage to point you out the extra day in leap year, and he will be more hopelessly at a loss than a man looking for a needle in a haystack. But even the most ignorant Christian will pick it out at the right end of February as neatly and inevitably as a lovebird on a barrel organ picking out a fortune. The art of prophecy has grown with civilization. Prophets were regarded as almost divine persons in the old days, but now every man is his own Isaiah. I am the most modest of the prophets, but even I venture to foretell that there will be an annular eclipse of the sun in the coming year on the 8th of April, that it will begin at 22 minutes to 8 a.m. at Liverpool, and that it will be visible at Greenwich. What clairvoyant could go further? Test my mantic gifts at any other point, and I doubt not I can satisfy you. Do you want to know at what time there will be high water at Aberdeen on the afternoon of the 21st of January? The answer is 13 minutes past 1. Do you want to know when partridge shooting will begin? I do not even need to reflect before giving the answer. The 1st of September. And so I could go on, almost ad infinitum, filling in the details of the year in advance. On the 1st of March, for instance, being St. David's Day, there will be a banquet at which Mr. Lloyd George will make a reference to hills, mists, God, in a country called Wales. On the 28th of March, being Easter Monday, there will be a bank holiday. On the 24th of May, being Empire Day, the majority of shops in Regent Street will hang out Union Jacks, and school children will salute the flag at Abinger Hammer, Communists in various parts of London gnashing their teeth the while. On the 15th of June, the anniversary of Magna Carta will fall and will pass without any disturbance. On the 12th of July, orange men will dress in sashes and listen to orators whose speeches will prove the hollowness of the old adage that you cannot serve both God and mammon. On the same day, Lord Birkenhead will celebrate his 49th birthday showing that gallopers are born, not made. Need I continue, however? The year is obviously going to be a crowded one. It will, as I have said, contain 365 days, and will come to an end at 12 p.m. on St. Sylvester's Day, at the time of the new moon. I have said enough, I think, to prove that one knows a great deal more about the future than is generally realized. There may be skeptics who doubt the virtue of my prophecies, if there be such, all I ask is that they should mark them well and verify each of them as its fulfillment falls due. The expense will be small. The most serious item will be the journey to Aberdeen to see the tide coming in on the 24th of January. 
but by taking up a collection in Aberdeen, it should be possible to reduce one's net outlay by the better part of a shilling. On the whole, there never were prophecies easier to verify. I confidently challenge comparison between them and any prophecy made by any cabinet minister during the last five years. I even challenge comparison with the much more respectable prophecies contained in Raphael's prophetic messenger. Raphael at times strains our credulity. When he tells us, for instance, that on the 27th of April it is going to be cold and frosty, and that on the 29th of April we shall see high winds, storm, and thunder, we feel that he is giving a free rein to his imagination and treating prophecy not as a science but as an art. That the 30th of April will be showery, I agree, but how does he know that there will be high wind and lightning on the 21st of December? I am also somewhat puzzled as to the means by which he arrives at the conclusions set forth in his everyday guide for each day in the year. I can myself prophesy what you will do on each day, but I cannot, as he does, prophesy what you ought to do. This introduces an ethical element which is beyond my scope or horoscope. We need not quarrel with him when he dismisses the 1st of January as an unimportant day, but when he bids us on the 2nd of January court, marry, and deal with females, we may reasonably ask why. His advice for the 3rd is more acceptable. Be careful, he says, until 1 p.m., then seek work and push thy business. That is about the time of day one prefers to begin to seek work. Would there were more days in the calendar like the 3rd of January? Some saint must have it in his keeping. On the 7th, however, it will be safer to abstain from work altogether. Raphael says, a very unfortunate p.m. and evening for most purposes. Court and deal with females. Sunday the 9th is better. Ask favors, he says, in the p.m., and court. Though January is less than half gone, I confess I'm getting a little breathless with so much courting. Raphael probably recognizes this, and a note of caution creeps into his advice on the 13th, on which he bids us court and marry in the morning. Then be careful. By the 18th, however, he is his old self again. Court, he says cheerfully, marry and ask favors and push ahead. Then come one rather careful day and two unfortunate ones, till on the 22nd, in a burst of exuberance, he offers us the day of our lives. Deal with others, he exhorts us, and push thy business. Seek work, travel, court, marry, buy, and speculate. I doubt if all this can be crowded into 24 hours outside the Arabian Nights. Besides, as a result of following Raphael's advice, we are already bigamists several times over, and have become sick of the sight of a registry office. By the end of the month, even Raphael shows signs of being a little weary of his scarcely veiled incitements to bluebeardism. For the 29th, he advises, avoid females and be very careful. And for the 30th, which is a Sunday, avoid females and superiors. I should just about think so. We need not follow Raphael through the rest of the year. It is enough to say that he keeps us busy courting, marrying, seeking work, being careful, traveling, speculating, pushing ahead, and avoiding females right down to the end of December. He occasionally varies his formula, as when on the 6th of April he bids us, Do not quarrel, be quiet. And when on the 23rd of June he advises, Ask favors of females, and travel. On the whole, however, his recommendations leave us with a sense of the desperate monotony of human existence. It is no wonder the novelists find it so difficult to invent an original plot. Nothing seems to happen, even in the future, except the same old thing. It is all as monotonous as north, south, east, and west. We turn with relief to the page on which Raphael tells us what are the best days in which to hire maidservants, and to set turkeys. Our interest redoubles when we come on his advice to those about to kill pigs. Do this, he says, between eight and ten in the morning, and between the first quarter and full of the moon. The pigs will weigh more, and the flavor of the pork be improved. Then there are legal and commercial notes, 
one of which a bailiff must not break into a house but he may enter by the chimney suggests a subject for a drawing by mr george morrow the medical notes are equally worthy of consideration on one page we are given a list of herbal remedies and we are told how one disease can be cured by pouring boiling water on hay upland hay being better than meadow hay and applying it to the stomach but raphael is no crank as we see in his suggestions for the treatment of influenza if you think you have got an attack of influenza slip off to bed at once and take the whiskey or brandy bottle with you and don't be afraid of it for alcohol is the best medicine you can take as it kills germs in the blood do not wait until you are half dead remember that a stitch in time saves nine even with health even on the subject of the care of children's teeth he makes it clear that whoever may have come under the blight of pussyfoot it is not he i believe a committee is to be appointed to inquire into the failing eyesight and decaying teeth in children i think i have already stated that these troubles were due to the excessive amount of sugar or sweet stuffs consumed all sweet things cause an excess of exudation of saliva from the gums which affect and impair both the teeth and the eyesight for despite of what dentist and doctor may say there is an intimate relation between the two dr sims wallace the eminent lecturer on dental surgery recommends beer or dry champagne as an excellent mouthwash they are also pleasant to the throat and stomach the reader is now in a position to estimate for himself the extent to which he can rely on raphael's judgment and decide how far he will accept the horoscope raphael has cast for mr lloyd george on this he writes this gentleman has figured so prominently in our national affairs for the last few years that it may not be out of place if i give a few remarks on his horoscope the time of his birth is stated to have been january seventeenth eighteen sixty three eight hours fifty five minutes a m but neither myself nor other astrologers are satisfied with this hour i think he was born some minutes sooner at his birth the sun was in exact square to jupiter and also in square to mars and mars was in opposition to jupiter these are very ominous and important aspects the former denotes great extravagance and waste of money and the latter gives impetuosity and danger to the person he then proceeds to give a brief analysis of mr lloyd george's horoscope the sun near ascendant self-praise egotism self-satisfaction fondness for publicity and notoriety venus and mercury in ascendant fluency in speech agreeableness desire to please fondness for music arts and sciences mars in second in opposition to jupiter unfavorable for financial undertakings extravagance carelessness and losses in speculation uranus in fourth trouble at end of life jupiter in eighth benefit or help from marriage partner moon near cusp of the eleventh many friends especially females the aspects denote sun square jupiter and mars recklessness and expenditure public disapprobation and an unfavorable and sudden ending to life venus in trine to saturn and moon in sextile to jupiter domestic relations of the happiest description and the wife a great help i frankly doubt if any man can foretell the future of mr lloyd george no one knows what he will say or do to-morrow we know what phrases he will use but we do not know on what side he will use them or what he will mean by them all we know is that sir william sutherland will say ditto let us then return to safer fields of prophecy what really is going to happen in nineteen twenty one i think i know human beings will behave like bewildered sheep they will be chiefly notable for their lack of moral courage good men will apologize for the deeds of bad men and bad men will do very much as they please cruel and selfish faces will be seen in every railway carriage and in every omnibus but readers of the respectable press will refuse to believe that there are any cruel people outside germany and russia 
not one but all the ten commandments will be broken and turkeys will be eaten on christmas day men will die of disease violence famine and old age and others will be born to take their place intellectuals will be pretentious mules solemnly trying to look like derby winners there will be a considerable amount of lying injustice and self-righteousness dogs will be fairly decent but some of them will bite above all the human conscience will survive it will survive it will continue to be the old still small voice we know as still and as small as it is possible to be without disappearing into silence and nothingness and some of us will get a certain amusement out of it all and will prefer life rather than death we shall also go on puzzling ourselves as to what under the sun it all means not even a murderer will be without a friend or a pet dog or cat or bird that is what nineteen twenty one will be like that at least is as certain as the time of the high tide at aberdeen on the twenty fourth of january end of chapter seven chapter eight of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis the pleasures of ignorance by robert lind on knowing the difference it was only the other day that i came upon a full-grown man reading with something like rapture a little book ships and seafaring shown to children his rapture was modified however by the bitter reflection that he had already passed so great a part of his life without knowing the difference between a ship and a bark and as for sloops yawls cutters catches and brigantines they were simply the russian alphabet to him i sympathize with his regret it was a noble day in one's childhood when one had learned the names of sailing vessels and walking to the point of the harbour beyond the bathing boxes could correct the ignorance of a friend that's not a ship that's a brig to the boy from an inland town every vessel that sails is a ship he feels he is being shown a new and bewildering world when he is told that the only ship that has the right to be called a ship is a vessel with three masts at least all of them square rigged when once he has learned his lesson he finds an unaccustomed delight in wandering along the dirtiest coal quay and recognizing the barks by the fact that only two of their three masts are square rigged and the brigs by the fact that they are square rigged throughout a sort of two masted ships vessels have suddenly become as real to him in their differences as the different sorts of common birds as for his feelings on the day on which he can tell for certain the upper fore topsail from the upper fore top gallant sail and either of these from the fore sky sail the cross jack or the mizzen royal they are those of a man who has mastered a language and discovers himself to his surprise talking it fluently the world of shipping has become articulate poetry to him instead of a monotonous abracadabra it is as though we can know nothing of a thing until we know its name can we be said to know what a pigeon is unless we know that it is a pigeon we may have seen it again and again with its bottle shoulders and shining neck sitting on the edge of its chimney pot and noted it as a bird with a full bosom and swift wings but if we are not able to name it except vaguely as a bird we seem to be separated from it by an immense distance of ignorance learn that it is a pigeon however and immediately it rushes towards us across the distance like something seen through a telescope no doubt to the pigeon fancier this would seem but the first lisping of knowledge 
and he would not think much of our acquaintance with pigeons if we could not tell a carrier from a powder that is the charm of knowledge it is merely a door into another sort of ignorance there are always new differences to be discovered new names to be learned new individualities to be known new classifications to be made the world is so full of a number of things that no man with a grain of either poetry or the scientific spirit in him has any right to be bored though he lived for a thousand years terror or tragedy may overwhelm him but boredom never the infinity of things forbids it i once heard of a tipsy young artist who on his way home on a beautiful night had his attention called by a maudlin friend to the stars where they twinkled like a million larks he raised his eyes to the heavens then shook his head there are too many of them he complained wearily it should be remembered however that he was drunk and that he did not know astronomy there could be too many stars only if they were all turned out on the same pattern and made the same pattern on the sky fortunately the universe is the creation not of a manufacturer but of an artist there is scarcely a subject that does not contain sufficient asias of differences to keep an explorer happy for a lifetime it would be easy to do nothing but chase butterflies all one's days it is said that thirteen thousand species of butterflies have been already discovered and it is suggested that there may be nearly twice as many that have so far escaped the naturalists after so monstrous a figure we are not surprised to learn that there are sixty-eight species of butterflies in great britain and ireland we should be astonished however had we not already expended our astonishment on the larger number how many of us are there who could name even half a dozen varieties we all know the tortoise shell and the white and the blue the little blue butterflies that flutter over the gold and red of the cornfields but the average man does not even know by name such varieties as the camberwell beauty the dingy skipper the pearl-bordered fritillary and the white letter hair streak as for the moth are there not as many sorts of moths as there are words in a dictionary many men give all the pleasant hours of their lives to learning how to know the difference between one of them and another one used to see these moth hunters on windless nights in the hampstead lane pursuing their quarry fantastically with nets in the light of the lamps in pursuing moths they pursue knowledge this they feel is life at its most exciting its most intense they regard a man who does not know and is not interested in the difference between one moth and another as a man not yet thoroughly awakened from his prenatal sleep and indeed one could not conceive a more appalling sort of blank idiocy than the condition of a man who could not tell one thing from another in any department of life whatever we would rather change lives with a jellyfish than with such a man this luxury of variety was not meant to be ignored we throw ourselves into it with exhilaration as a swimmer plunges into the sea there are few forms of happiness i know which are more enviable than that of those who have eyes for birds and flowers how they rejoice on learning that according to one theory there are a hundred and three different species of brambles to be found in these islands they would not have them fewer by a single one it is extraordinarily pleasant even for one who is mainly ignorant of the flowers and their families to come on two or three varieties of one flower in the course of a country walk as a boy he is excited by the difference between the pin-headed and the thrum-headed primrose as he grows older he scans the roadside for little peeping things that to a lazy eye seem as like each other as two peas 
the dove's foot geranium the round-leaved geranium and the lesser wild geranium as like each other as two peas we have said but are two peas like each other who knows whether the peas have not the same differences of feature among themselves that englishmen have half the similarities we notice are only the results of our ignorance and idleness the townsman passing a field of sheep finds it difficult to believe that the shepherd can distinguish between one and another of them with as much certainty as if they were his children and do not most of us think of foreigners as beings who are all turned out as if on a pattern like sheep the further removed the foreigners are from us in race the more they seem to us to be like each other when we speak of negroes we think of millions of people most of whom look exactly alike we feel much the same about chinamen and even turks probably to a chinaman all english children look exactly alike and it may be that all europeans seem to him to be as indistinguishable as sticks of barley sugar how many people think of jews in this way i have heard an englishman expressing his wonder that jewish parents should be able to pick out their own children in a crowd of jewish boys and girls thus our first generalizations spring from ignorance rather than from knowledge they are true so long as we know that they are not entirely true as soon as we begin to accept them as absolute truths they become lies one of the perils of a great war is that it revives the passionate faith of the common man in generalizations he begins to think that all germans are much the same or that all americans are much the same or that all conscientious objectors are much the same in each case he imagines a lay figure rather than a human being he may hate his lay figure or he may like it but if he is in search of truth he had better throw the thing out of the window and try to think about a human being instead i do not wish to deny the importance of generalizations it is not possible to think or even to act without them the generalization that is founded on a knowledge of and a delight in the variety of things is the end of all science and poetry keats said that he sought the principle of beauty in all things and poems are in a sense simply beautiful generalizations they subject the unclassified and chaotic facts of life to the order of beauty the mystic meditating on the one and the many is also in pursuit of a generalization the perfect generalization of the universe and what is science but the attempt to arrange in a series of generalizations the facts of what we are vain enough to call the known world to know the resemblances of things is even more important than to know the differences of things indeed if we are not interested in the former our pleasure in the latter is a mere scrapbook pleasure if we are not interested in the latter on the other hand our sense of the former is apt to degenerate into guesswork and assertion and empty phrases shakespeare is greater than all the other poets because he more than anybody else knew how very like human beings are to each other and because he more than anybody else knew how very unlike human beings are to each other he was master of the particular as well as of the universal how much poorer the world would have been if he had not been so in regard not only to human beings but to the very flowers if he had not been able to tell the difference between fennel and fumitory between the violet and the jilly flower end of chapter eight chapter nine of the pleasures of ignorance this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn The Pleasures of Ignorance by Robert Lind Chapter 9 The Intellectual Side of Horse Racing Horse racing, or at least betting, is one of the few crafts that are looked down upon by practically everybody who does not take part in it. It's a mug's game, people say. Even betting men talk like this. There is a street called Muggs Row in a north of England town. It is so called because the houses in it were built by a bookmaker. Whether it was the bookmaker or his victims that gave the street its name, I do not know. To call a bookmaker a mug would seem to most people an abuse of language. Yet the only bookmaker I have ever really known used to confess himself a mug in the most penitent fashion. He was a mug, however, not because he could not make money, but because he could not keep it. The poor of his suburb, when in difficulties, he declared, he used always to come to him instead of going to the clergy, and he was unable to refuse them. But then he was bitter against the clergy. As a young man, he had been a Sunday school teacher, and so far as I could gather, he might have gone on being a Sunday school teacher till the present day if he had not suddenly been assailed with doubts one Sabbath afternoon as he expounded the story of David and Goliath. Whether it was that he had looked on David as having taken an unsportsmanlike advantage of the giant, or whether he doubted that so much could be done with such little stones, he did not make quite clear. Anyhow, from that day on, he never believed in revealed religion. He quarreled with his clergyman. He broke the Sabbath. He began to drink beer and to go to race meetings. He rapidly rose from the position of carpenter to that of bookmaker, and were it not for his infernal gift of charity, he would probably now be driving his own car and be hallmarked with a coalition title. Even as it was, he was much more prosperous than any carpenter. Whenever he produced money, it was in pocketfuls and handfuls. Strange that a bookmaker who, by his trade, must be accustomed to miracles, should find it difficult to believe in David and Goliath. He was possibly a man who betted on form, and on form Goliath should undoubtedly have won. David was an outsider. He had no breeding. He would have been surprised if he could have foreseen how his victory would rankle some thousands of years later in the soul of an honest English bookmaker. It is, however, just these matters of form and breeding that raise horse racing and betting above the intellectual level of a game of nap. Betting men who ignore these things are as unintellectual as the average novelist. There are some, for instance, who shut their eyes and bring down a pen or pencil on a list of names of the horses in the hope that this way they may discover a winner. No doubt they may. It is perhaps as good a way as any other, but there is something trivial in such methods. This is mere gambling for the sake of excitement. There is no more fundamental brain work in it than in a game I saw being played in a railway carriage the other day, when a man drew a handful of coins from his pocket and bet his friend half a sovereign that there would be more heads than tails lying uppermost. This is a game at which it is possible to lose five pounds in two minutes. It is the sort of game to which a betting man will resort when an extremist, but only then. The ruling passion is strong, however. I have a friend who, on one occasion, went into retreat in a Catholic monastery. Two well-known bookmakers had also gone into temporary retreat for the good of their souls. My friend told me that even during the religious services, the bookmakers used to bet as to which of the monks would stand up first at the conclusion of a prayer, and that in the solemn hush of the worship, you would suddenly hear a hoarse whisper, two to one on Brownie, a brother with hair that color, and the answer, I take you, Joe. I have even heard of men betting as to which of two raindrops on a window pane will reach the bottom first. It is possible to bet on cats, rats, or flies. Calvinists do not bet, because they believe that everything that happens is a certainty. The extreme betting man is no Calvinist, however. He believes that most things are accidents, and the rest catastrophes. Hence his philosophy is almost always that of Epicurus. To him, every day is a new day, at the end of which it is his aim to be able to say, like Horace, 
Fixi, or, as the text ought perhaps to read, Vici. The intellectual betting man, on the other hand, has a position somewhere between the extremes of Calvinism and Epicureanism. He worships neither certainty nor chance. He reckons up probabilities. When Mr. Asquith picked out Spy and Cop as the winner of the Derby, he did so because he went about the business of selection not with a pen or a pencil, but with one of the best brains in England. In the course of his long conflicts with the House of Lords, he had probably interested himself somewhat profoundly in questions of heredity and pedigree, and he was thus well equipped for an investigation into the records of the parentage and grandparentage of the various derby horses. All that the ordinary casual better knows about Spy and Cop is that he is the son of Spearmint, which won the derby in 1906. This, however, would not alone make him an obviously better horse than Orpheus, whose sire, Orby, won the derby in 1907. The student of breeding must be a feminist who pays as much attention to the female as to the male line. It was by the study of the female line that the most cunning of the sporting journalists were able to eliminate Tetratema from the list of probable winners. Tetratema, as son of the Tetrarch, was excellently fathered for staying the mile-and-a-half course at Epsom. More than this, as a writer in The Sportsman pointed out, the Tetrarch himself is by Roy Herodi a fine stayer, and his maternal granddam was by Hegioscope, who rarely failed to transmit stamina. It is when we turn to Tetrema's mother, Scotch Gift, or is it his grandmother something else, apparently, that we discover his hereditary vice. This mare our journalist exposed to scathing and searching criticism, and concluded that there can be nothing unreasonable in the inference, based on the records of this family, that the chances are against a derby winner having descended from the least distinguished of four sisters. Even so, however, the writer a few sentences later abjures Calvinism, and denies that there is anything certain in what he calls breeding problems. It seemed, he writes, wildly improbable at one time that Flying Duchess would produce a derby winner, for I believe that it is correct that two of Gallopin's elder brothers ran in a bus, and there were two others quite useless. So, on the face of it, the chances were against Gallopin, the younger brother. I quote these passages as evidence of the immense demand the serious pursuit of horse racing puts on the intellect. The betting man must be as well versed in precedence as a lawyer, and in the genealogical trees as a historian. At school, I always found the genealogical trees the most difficult and bewildering part of history, yet the genealogical tree of a king is a simple matter compared to that of a horse. All you have to learn about a king is the names of his relations. Regarding a horse, however, you must know not only the names but the character, staying power, and domestic virtues of every male and female with whom he is connected during several generations. If a man spent as much labor in disentangling the cousinship of the royal families of ancient Egypt, he would be venerated as a scholar in five continents. Oxford and Cambridge would shower degrees on him. Sir William Sutherland would get him a place on the civil list. Hence, it seems to me that tipping the winners is not, as is too often regarded, anybody's job. It is work that should be undertaken only by men of powerful mind. No man should be allowed to qualify as a tipster unless he has taken a degree at one of the universities. The ideal tipster would at once be a great historian, a great antiquary, a great zoologist, a great mathematician, and a man of profound common sense. It is no accident that an ex-prime minister was one of the few Englishmen to spot the winner of the Derby of 1920. Mr. Asquith must have gone patiently through all Spy on Cop's relations, weighing up the chances whether it was an accident or owing to the weather that such a one fifteen years ago was beaten by a neck in a six furlong race, studying incidents in every one of their careers, seeing that none of them had ever had a great uncle or a bus horse, bringing out a table of logarithms to decide difficult points, 
we need not be surprised that there are fewer great tipsters than great poets shakespeare alone has given us a portrait of the perfect tipster looking before and after in apprehension how like a god it is perhaps when we leave questions of breeding and come to those of form that we realize most fully the amazing intellectualism of the betting life in the study of form we are faced by problems that can be solved only by the higher algebra thus if jehoshaphat carrying seven stone ran third to jezebel carrying eight stone four pounds in a mile race and jezebel carrying eight stone four pounds was beaten by a neck by a woman in wine carrying seven stone nine pounds over a mile and a quarter and woman in wine carrying eight stones one pound was beaten by a tom thumb carrying nine stone in a mile hundred twenty yards and tom thumb carrying nine stone seven pounds was beaten by jehoshaphat over seven furlongs we have to calculate what chance tom thumb has of beating jezebel in a race of a mile and a half on a wet day there are men to whom such calculations may come easy to mr asquith they are probably child's play for myself i shrink from them and if i were a betting man would no doubt in sheer desperation be driven back on the method of pen and pencil but it is obvious that the sincere betting man has to make such calculations daily every morning the student of form finds his sporting page full of such lists as the following zero 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 conclusive seven dash five kronstadt conclusion eighth of nine to poltava gave seventeen pounds gatwick may six f and seventh of nineteen to orby's pride received four pounds kempton may five f three 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 rapier seven dash four sunder guruli lost three dash four length and three lengths to bantry gave two pound and marcia received seven pound newmarket may one m golden guinea gave twenty pound not in first nine see black jess zero zero four royal blue seven dash zero prince palatine china blue see northern light zero two zero black jess six dash eleven black jester diving bell not in first four to st quarantine gave twelve pound lingfield last week seven f here app seven f lost three lengths to victory speech received one pound rapier gave thirteen pound favorite length off zero llama six dash eleven Isard two laughing mirror nowhere to silver jug gave fifteen pound newberry app seven f is not a page of thucydides simpler is perseus himself more succinct or obscure our teachers used to apologize for teaching us latin grammar and mathematics by telling us that they were good mental gymnastics if education is only a matter of mental gymnastics however i should recommend horse racing as an ideal study for young boys and girls the sole objection to it is that it is so engrossing it might absorb the whole energies of the child the safety of latin grammar lies in its dullness no child is tempted by it into forgetting that there are other duties in life besides mental gymnastics horse racing on the other hand comes into our lives with the effect of a religious conversion it is the greatest monopolist among the pleasures it affects men's conversation it affects their entire outlook the betting man's is a dedicated life even books have a new meaning for him the ring and the book it is his one and only epic and it is the most intellectual of epics that is my point end of chapter nine